Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Possible Mediums Conference at The Ohio State University's Knowlton School of Architecture on this warm, sunny February day. This event is co-hosted by the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Architecture, the University of Kentucky's College of Design, and University of Michigan Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. My name is Christy Vallier, and I'm an assistant professor of architecture here at the Knowlton School of Architecture and one of the conference co-chairs. The Possible Mediums Conference is composed of a series of workshops and panel discussions revolving around four possible mediums, challenging the boundaries of architectural convention, the invited workshop leaders employ exploratory processes, processes rooted in mediums external to the discipline, such as film or comics, or developed from atypical applications of more conventional mediums, such as drawing or models. The technical sophistication and inventive applications of their work reflect two major developments within speculative architecture of the past decade. A broad diffusion of technological expertise and a shift from critical to projective theory. Preserving commitment to expertise and imagination, Possible Mediums places this group of designers in productive dialogue, unpacking, unpacking their collective foundations and futures. Before we dive too deep into the weekend's activities, I would like to take a moment to extend our appreciation to the many people that made this event possible, most notably our institutions for backing this project and encouraging its development. There's Michael Padwell, the director of the Knowlton School of Architecture, Beth Lodstein, section head of architecture, Monica Ponce de Leon, dean, the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan, Michael Speaks, dean of the College of Design at the University of Kentucky, and Robert Zomel, dean of architecture and the arts at the University of Illinois, Chicago. We would also like to thank our special guests who will be joining intermittently throughout the event. Jeffrey Kipnis, professor at The Ohio State University, and John McMorrow, chair of the architecture program at the University of Michigan. They have challenged us to make it happen, to be specific, and prepare for what is possible, or perhaps what is impossible. We would also like to thank the Nolan School of Architecture's staff, including Phil Arnold, Michael Baumberger, Megan Frazier, Holly Griffin, Megan, uh, Becky Leonardo, Lisa Rout, Doug Sertian, Jeff Shaw, and Carla Sharon. And yes, they all did have some significant part of today. Every mention, everyone mentioned here has been instrumental to pulling this event together. Without you, this would not have been possible. They checked the numbers, checked them twice, upgraded the power, and supported this initiative in numerous ways. The shopping list was odd, very odd. They ordered flocking, shiny, mirrored plastic, 30 bags of plaster, and balloons. Lots of balloons. Yeah, and <laughs> chickens. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Of course, we would also like to thank our invited guests and workshop leaders who have traveled quite far to be with us here this weekend. Whether we know you well or have been watching your work develop from afar, you have each been invited for, this, for the significant contrib contributions that you are making to the discourse. You teach, you design, and you develop a new possible. We thank you for joining us this weekend, and we thank you in advance for the work, talents, and time you will share with us over the next three days. And finally, we would like to thank the over 120 students that have signed up to participate in the 12 workshops. 70 of whom have traveled across the Midwest to join us here tonight. Your contributions promise to inform this discussion and carry it beyond these walls. I would like to conclude by recognizing my co-chairs, Kelly Bear, Adam Fury, Kyle Miller. This event was initiated this past July with a Skype call across three time zones, and it has been a productive conversation ever since. Kelly Bear is an assistant professor at the University of Illinois Chicago. Kyle Miller is an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky's College of Design. And Adam Fury is, the lecture, is a lecturer at the University of Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture. I will now have, hand it over to Adam, who will offer the conference introduction. This introduction will be followed by opening remarks by Jeffrey Kipnis. Thank you.
first off, as an outsider, just like to uh, echo um, Christian's appreciation of it's been a really coming uh, from another school uh, to a co host of the event and had it put on in this way. So I uh, just want to reiterate that kind of In October 2011, Sylvia Layman and Hal Foster got together for a public conversation at the storefront for art and architecture as part of the Productive Disagreement series. The setup is straightforward. The two would speak briefly about their recent books, Layman's Kissing Architecture and Foster's The Art Architecture Complex, and for the rest of the night, try and articulate the productive differences in their respective ideological positions. To no surprise, those differences surface fast. Layman is interested in new forms of architectural experience that are post-linguistic, post-feminist, and most importantly, of intense affect, while Foster holds firmly to the position of criticality and is suspicious of the recent dose to pop, as he calls it, such as beauty, affect, and celebration that have surfaced in the wake of criticality's so-called demands. Despite this, this seemingly insurmountable difference, Layman and Foster did, in fact, come together around the question of mediums. Both believe mediums to be plastic, that is, not to hold them to some unshakable form of specificity, but rather a malleable set of conventions that can be reorganized, reordered, and combined to produce new forms of experience, both critical and effective. In his book, Foster cites the work of Anthony, uh, artist Anthony O'Call, pointing to the ways in which he combines conventions from different mediums in his solid light films, such as Coupling, of 2009. <coughs> Outside of its basis in film, the vertical projections sculpt space as the light catches artificial mist, allowing visitors to walk amongst the films as if they were pieces of sculpture. When the light hits the floor, it illuminates moving lines, thus implicating installation and drawing as well. Still further, the projections rely heavily on the space of the gallery, both masking and exposing the architectural surroundings. Through this collection of conventions, McCall moves away from the modernist project of autonomy and medium specificity, putting film in conversation with a wide range of disciplines. Foster describes the experience of McCall's work as a kind of manifold self-reflexivity, a new form of critical awareness where one contemplates the provisional ontologies of the different mediums present while moving in and out of their respective phenomenologies as ex an experience both sensuous and cognitive. Layman evokes art as well, but is more concerned with the ways in which it comes together with architecture and productive moments of consilience. Pour Your Body Out, the 2008 installation by Pippolotti and Reese at the Museum of Modern Art, headlines kissing architecture and best illustrates the productivity of confounding mediums. In this installation, the wrist covered the expansive white walls of the most central atrium with lush images of fruit, flowers, and bodily close-ups. The upper balconies were covered by pink curtains and the giant circular proof covered the floor, soliciting visitors to, as the title suggests, pour their bodies out. Important for Layman is not only the internal specifics of pour your body out, but the ways in which the medium of installation offers MoMA new powers to produce audience, and offers architecture in general, a model of practice that looks to other mediums to help it redefine its internal means, methods, and values. Put bluntly by Layman, architecture needs to hook up with more cultural players to expand its effective range. For her, recalibrating the relation between mediums is nothing, is nothing less than a redefinition of architecture itself. This point of commonality between Layman and Foster, two critics staunchly opposed on so many points, is one of the many examples in current design discourse that signal to me and my co-chairs the potential productivity of a sustained focus on the question of mediums and contemporary architecture. Perhaps the last medium to dominate the discipline was computation, or more specifically, the nerve-based digital modeling platforms that appeared on the architectural scene nearly two decades ago. The potential of computation was self-evident and profound. It help, helps explain the rapid spread of these tools from the academic offices of the early pioneers in the 90s 
And the computer labs of top tier schools wholly devoted to the digital paradigm in the 2000s. As a media, this form of computation dominated architecture for the better part of a decade. But by the mid 2000s, the transition from amateurism to expertise, the necessary progression for any novel medium, had all but fully occurred. By this time, these technologies were no longer exclusive, were limited to speculative architecture, and had made their way into commercial practice. Within the academy, pressured by the tonal shift from critical to projective theory, the discourse surrounding these technologies moved from technical to experiential, as digital formalism was reframed in terms of performance and aesthetics. A publication of Oliver Heen and Heen and Jamal's guest edited issue of ADD type developments is symptomatic of this time. Responding precisely to the aforementioned evolution from digital amateurism to expertise, Rahim and Jamel attempted to equate advanced digital design with a homogenous, seamless aesthetic. Even in 2007, the year the issue came out, one did not have to go far to see promising digital work that fell outside this aesthetic category. In general, the problem with a branding exercise such as elegance was that digital work was not moving forward and toward a point, it was expanding horizontally infiltrating extra-disciplinary mediums and folding them back into architecture. The work of Michael Meredith and Hilary Sample and Moss is perhaps the first practice of this generation to fully diversify the profile of working mediums. The forays into movies, installations, and software design demonstrate an agility agility to respond to a range of dis disciplinary issues with creativity, humor, and wit. Understanding architecture fully within the context of a post-medium condition, their practice uses various media, media to diversify architecture's audience. This opening up of architecture in terms of mediums is even more apparent today, evidenced by a quick scan of the possible medium roster. We've invited designers to participate in design through exploratory processes, rooted in mediums external to the discipline, or develop from unconventional applications of more conventional mediums. Some technological in nature, such as robotics, digital fabrication, interactive sensing technology, custom CNC machines, others conventional, as in architectural models, materials, drawings, and some appropriated from outside the discipline, such as installation, fashion, toys, comics, giant furniture, pinatas, balloons, 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 <laughs> and more balloons. From the newest technology to the most classic convention, these designers are activated by a wide range of mediums to produce their work. We have organized this conference to underscore the potential and excitement of our current work in architecture. By bringing this group of designers together, we hope to showcase their mediums and expose the conversations necessary to move our work forward collectively. The conference is structured as a series of workshops and public discussions. The workshop format was adopted for two reasons. To emphasize the ways in which the invited designers work, in other words, to highlight their medium, and to allow students from both schools direct, direct access to the workshop leaders. The workshops are divided into four groups, which break down the possible or possible mediums into more specific subtopics. These groups were curated by me and my three co-chairs in order to highlight the commonalities amongst the group members and to define a disciplinary project that supersedes any one of them. Over the next two days, each workshop group will hold a panel discussion where we will elucidate the theoretical implications and disciplinary foundations of such projects. At tomorrow at noon, we will hear from the first group, Figural, Figural Projections, curated by Kelly Baer. This group engages the study of architectural legibility related to figural form and shape. Subverting the conventions of projective geometry, these designs employ narrative, optical decep deception, and an ambiguously precise massing to craft imaginative worlds. 
The work of Angie Coe blends analytical documentation with speculation. Working through prototypes that vary in scale from very large furniture objects to very small building objects, her work establishes a catalog of basic architectural components that are estranged from their histories in order to reinvent new structural logics, material behaviors, and programmatic organizations. Jimenez Lai describes his approach to architecture as one of making, quote, absurd stories about fake realities that invite enticing possibilities, end quote. While his medium is deeply rooted in cartoons, referencing manga and comics, the work elucidates historical and theoretical issues critical to the discipline of architecture. Thomas Kelly uses conventional drawing techniques in unconventional ways. In his work, the rules of projective geometry remain intact, while at the same time, perceptual tricks are being orchestrated through subtle geometric transformations, illusory devices, and literary rules. The next group is tactile objects created by myself, uh, which brings together a group of designers to find new disciplinary territory for materials and form. Moving beyond the common criteria of performance, complexity, and elegance, this group steers material and formal articulation toward the tactile, the visceral, and the animal. In Andrew Holder's work, one can see a novel set of formal, formal characteristics where fatness and posture replace sleekness and legibility. With varying proportional relationships to their containers, Holder insert highly developed oversized objects into static spaces, suggesting new relationships between the subjects and objects of architecture. Michael Lovridge develops the animal as a formal characteristic to an absurd level, and I mean that in the best sense of the term. Uh, fully embracing the object of toys, Loveridge designs objects that he calls toys, but more closely resemble strange creatures, renders them in their native environments, and concocts elaborate narratives of their mythical origins. Both formally and materially, Loveridge's objects evoke strange associations and exotic passions often absent from architectural form. Ellie Abrams' practice focuses heavily on materiality and habits. Her work extracts latent physical traits from materials through specialized treatments, creating a fluctuating relationship of eccentric materiality to form. Sometimes grafting onto it like a blotch or growth, and at other times taking the form over entirely. Avoiding any nostalgic notion of material essence, Abrams approaches multi-sensory experience with contemporary sensibilities. Active models, curated by Kyle Miller, showcases designers using interactive technology to link digital and physical environments. Through embedded computation, continuous measurement, and kinetics, their work produces new ways of visual, spatial, and formal engagement. Multiple research projects initiated by Andrew Atwood, self-made robots are used to translate drawings into objects. Atwood identifies drawing as the primary medium for architectural production and embraces the gap that emerges during the process of physical three-dimensional translation. Jason Kelly Johnson employs interactive technology in order to create a series of what his office terms live models. Dynamic formations that measure, register change, and, and adapt. These models and the interactive technologies that they employ collect, translate, and enliven data, producing architectural objects and spaces that are both performative and engaging. Mariana Ibanez and Simon Kim present optimistic and engaging scenarios for the synthesis of architecture, design, interactive technology, and engineering. Denying the false assumption that architecture must be static and inert, they propose kinetic surfaces, objects, and structures that change the way humans interact with the built environment. <coughs> Excessive volumes, the fourth and final group curated by Kristen Valley, features designers who calibrate depth and spatial intervals with sharp expertise. All underwritten by advanced digital tools, these designers have surpassed an internal discourse of generative computing in favor of a broader focus 
on the tectonic, optical, and atmospheric effects of biological modeling. Brennan Buck and David Freeland translated dynamic qualities of digital drawing and form into striking architectural spaces. Through intricate art to hall relationships and overt colorful embellishments, their work produces architectural environments that are both optically and sensorially provocative. The work of Michael Young produces strong visual sensations of depth, movement, and speed. Through techniques that are unimaginably straightforward and thus incredibly intelligent, his drawings and forms demonstrate the deep experiential capacities in digital design. Justin Dobbs, through his work, carefully calibrates relationships between volume, mass, and atmosphere. Oscillated between structural and visual logics, Dobbs produces architecture that is both highly specific and atmospherically elusive. We have invited John McMurrow and Jeffrey Gittins to aid us in our theoretical pursuits. John McMurrow, through his writing, teaching, and practice, has done a great deal to elucidate the potential of diversified mediums in architecture. His writings on the work of Moss, Panopia, Alonzo, Alexander Eisenschmidt, and Hemen Islai has astutely contextualized and made legible the disciplinary relevance of these designers' work in the context of mediums. Through his practice, he has also demonstrated the potential, the potential of diversified architectural media. Uh, actually, his arrival to the conference is being delayed as the shooting in architectural sitcom uh, in the TV studio at the University of Michigan as we speak, which uh, personally I'm really excited to see. Uh, Jeffrey Kipnis needs little introduction anywhere, especially in his home school, but it is appropriate to say that no writer, critic, or theorist has been more influential in guiding speculative architecture in the past three decades than him, and we are honored to have him as part of our event. In conclusion, this is both a working conference and a conference about work. The discussions from the panel to the studios to the bar will be discursive work. The workshops design work. We will talk about work directly, not only how we work, but why. For us, the focus on mediums is a way to return to a conversation on a process with new theoretical focus. Process talk was understandably demonized in the mid-2000s as it produced an unnecessary rift within, within the discipline between those on the specialized interior and those on the uninformed exterior. Tapping into the contemporary discussion on mediums allows us to consider process with a full understanding of the consequences of our answers. Mediums have widespread implications for architecture. They determine how our discipline creates subjects and audiences, and how it operates in systems of culture and power. Put another way, to define one's medium today is to define the very agency of architecture. Mediums are no longer self-evident. They need to be constructed, which makes the question of how and why we do what we do a lot of importance. Just 
the silverback phase of my life, and you know, so I have to do these opening remarks. And my whole history of Weiss and Silverbacks is Weiss and pathetic and patriarchal people like uh, Peter Eisman and Ken Frampton, just you know, or people in tears, or complete insane idiots like um, Charles Chang's or Dennis Sharp. Trying to keep up, which is even worse. So I'm not just trying to keep up. I have to go the paper, the patriarchal route. Uh, I'll try to do it with a glint in my eye. Uh, I once watched Dennis Sharp, who was really a fantastic critic, try to cope with a similar body of work uh, in Japan, and he was going to categorize it, and then all, everybody's work came out insects. So, and it was kind of, you could understand, he showed Jesse Riser, he showed Stan and all that, and all, and all, and all, they all saw kinds of insects. So I won't do that tonight, actually I think Adam did a very nice job. I, uh, so I've divided my talk into, well, okay. so anyway, uh, I've written my uh, thing on my head, so I'm getting, I'm getting ready for my life. <laughs> and it says, uh, man, that was fantastic. <laughs> so now I'm writing my, uh, I'm writing the obituary, not the, you know, the, what's, what they give me the funeral? Eulogy. Assuming either Rob or Ben will do it. And I only have the first line. I only have the first line. It says, uh, I knew this guy a long time and he never learned to behave. That's it. That's it. That's how I want to do it. Anyway, I divided my uh, opening remarks into two sections a very short section called opening remarks and a longer section called closing remarks. And uh, I was given 20 minutes of that. So I, I, I managed to get it down to two hours. So <laughs> my students will be so happy. <laughs> I've kept the personal stories in. So about two minutes, two hours of my story. Um, first of all, I just want to tell you why I love the comics. I, I, I really do love it. Um, I love it, first of all, for its name, possible mediums. It, that, it's not against anything. It's not uh, anti-form, anti-program. It's not for or against anything. It's, it has a kind of intelligent humility about it. Uh, it's just possible. You have to think that's great. It's, it really states, I think, the right pace for a generation in relationship to students. And I also like mediums. Uh, finally, architecture has finally been able to figure out how to pluralize something. Like if you look up the international, hang on, if you look up the international uh, association, it's the International Association of Fortune Teller and Mediums which is the first time the word was actually codified and, and trademarked in the title of this. So long ago, about 40 years ago, those people figured it out. Even Adam was, couldn't figure out whether he should say mediums or media. It's not Greek anymore. Mediums is the plural I like. Um, I like the bizarre, you don't quite see it as well, it was the range of pinks. I do want you guys, as you're working through these problems, to work through, I'm going to give you what I consider the most important unsolved design problem in history. And that's these fucking name tags. Which has been honest with you, Karen actually has a perfect name for you. That no matter where you go, you can't find, you know, they either disappear, it's hard for women to wear them, it's hard for people, you know, it's just, the whole thing is weird. I think maybe something up here would be. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh, I love the youthfulness of all this. Um, you guys are so young, you, you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know your history, you, you run around with incredible amount of energy, <laughs> which is why I come in for a little bit tonight and I go away for a day. And, you know, you try, I just, it's exhausting. It's exhausting to see people running around. My life is basically, Bev and I decided to go to a movie at noon, about three, we say, The ninth thing of it is fantastic. I, I got on the phone last night. I got Jesse Reiser, Greg Lynn, Liz Diller, Michael Merrick. I got a bunch of people. Uh, and, I, and I got that down with and I said, you know, let's do this with me. And we were all laughing about the fact that, that you guys don't know that we already did all this stuff first a long time ago, about you know, 10, 15 years ago. And it reminded me of that really funny scene in the, you, this joke won't even mean anything to you about a telephone rod and bark so you can. <laughs> two, two young girls were in a record store and they were really excited to find an album by Paul McCartney and Wings. And uh, I went over to them and I said, did you know they were in a band before this? You know, <laughs> 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 
Paul Barnier's The Beatles. <laughs> Look at that. Isn't it very helpful? <laughs> so, uh, the, the nonsensical stuff. Uh, what the fuck is excessive on? Like, you know, I, I've been trying to figure this out. Right? Why not space? Why not void? I realized that the change from space to solid void was important because it became a kind of formalist idea, but I've been trying to figure out why go to volume and then why go to excessive volume. I did make it connect to certain things a little bit later, uh, understanding that perhaps I should be more self-reflective when I think about excessive volume. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paragoidia. You know, he pretends like this is a real brief word. Made it up, and it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic idea. It's the Greek word for looking at clouds and seeing faces or other forms in it, which the Greeks didn't do. So I had to have a Greek word for it. But anyway, it was so good. I went, I rewrote my syllabus, my visiting uh, lecture series at Princeton, put it throughout. That. And I've been pretending all day long at various critics that I've known for a long time. <laughs> I love this. And some of these guys I've known. Some I've met, some I've met and known, uh, some of my colleagues, certainly the Nemesis has had a fantastic influence on me. Um, which brings me to the last one, I guess, and that is um, how the conference was curated, uh, which was done by friends being in contact with friends and more uh, Very quick, most a lot of these kids went to these sort of kids. This entire audience, Except for three people, one there and two over here are kids. <laughs> um, this entire group of young, exciting people uh, know each other, work together, and you know it's a funny thing because in the discipline of your for ten or anything like that, they can always want to know that it was critical that somebody, you know, your paper was peer reviewed or external reviewed or the conference that you went to was blind reviewed, and they can count the number of people that got in and all that sort of stuff. Whereas the, the sociology of architecture is not that way. It's about friends talking to friends. It's about small groups with intense interest in hysterically ridiculous ideas protecting each other by talking to each other as if they were serious ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and they do that for a long time before they go forward. And then when they find out how stupid they were, they go back and do it again. And so but, you know, I, uh, I watched Andy Zaga's lecture at SciArt. And I it, was, it was really like listening to a publication of our mail to each other or our conversation to each other. It was so personal, everything he said, and yet it was clear, disciplinary based, really great work, real great theoretical. So it sounded like theory and, and uh, uh, design analysis in one group, but to me it sounded like conversations that we put in print. And that is the way that it's not just teachers and students, it's students and other students and colleagues, and what you see are forming now is I think that kind of conversation among this group. Uh, so starting off knowing each other really breaks down the distance. I think that, you know, if you go into a curated uh, conference and everything's been selected by submission of paper by a blind reviewer, you basically start off in competition. You start off wanting to know who's going to give the best work. I mean, you, you just, that's it. So whereas this, you're going to be starting off with this desire for there to be a collective production that you all are part of and take part of. Share credit for it. So that's the opening remarks. Now for the closing remarks. Uh, this is what you're going to do wrong. And this is what I would say. These, imagine that when John is speaking on Saturday, uh, you're hearing me say these things, and uh, it will be much better. <laughs> so it, it, it'll go like this John will. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
or rich, powerful governments are going to build buildings because they're expensive. So we can't sit around whining about it anymore. Um, we've got to figure out tricks to trick rich, power people into sitting and building stuff they like that actually makes fun of them being rich and powerful. <laughs> That's what apparently you guys are doing. <laughs> Hence the dead chickens. Um, <laughs> We also know that and we, we're all experts at reading sodas. I mean, I've seen little five-year-old kids read sodas. You know? So it's not that the critical project is demised. It's the version of it that we know and grew up with uh, is finished. It's we completed it. You don't need to keep studying and adding. Uh, if you're a mathematician, there's not new papers on adding. But on the other hand, most math mathematicians continue to learn adding and use it. So I, I want you, so I'm not going to actually try to give you the critical, but I am going to give you the two instruments that I think are really important for the work to grow. And the first one is analysis. Yeah, so I, if you don't mind, I don't usually do this when I read it, because I wrote it. Uh, analyses are to any and every discipline and profession what enzymes are to a body. The catalyst, the direct and accelerate reaction. For disciplines and professions, analyses dramatically accelerate understanding, discrimination, and judgment, and thus set the stage for all subsequent actions, whether rote determinations, best guesses, or creative leaps. On the other hand, since analyses are violent productions and always violent productions of reality, whose resulting canon is optimized to serve a value system, they also act as very strong policing agents. And analyses, in the end, after they've lived their life of enabling things, tend to start shutting things down. And I think that's the complaint about criticality. Uh, thus, analyses are the scene, but never the cause of this disciplinary evolution, revolution, and both of which come on and culminate in new analytic regimes and new canons. Finally, this is really important, uh, analyses are always derivative. They're never created. In and of themselves, they can never produce intrinsically valid or valuable decisions. They must always come, these must always come from an outside source, whether intuitive or intellectual. While the history of effective analysis in architecture is quite extraordinary, the profession's curious desire to automate its decisions, basically for legal reasons, through analysis is one of the discipline's most conspicuous flaws. Or to say it more simply, the idea of analysis synthesis is a misguided ambition that would never work as the history of all the sad efforts that have tried to do it, from bubble diagrams to data scapes, I think is demonstrated uh, adequately. So, I want you to think in what sense your work and your collective work teaches you to analyze things differently. So if by the end of each group, there'll be a lot of similarity, but hopefully if you're in the group, you will know important differences. And that is the beginning of the intuition for analysis, and that is where the growth will occur. Uh, I'm going to show you some slides. There's actually some new ones. For those that have seen me lecture, I think it's important. So, slide show. Uh, this is a bad analogy. I'm just, this is an analogy that seems to think this painting is uh, hypnotic. <laughs> it's a more typical analysis. Uh, this is an analysis of the same painting based on uh, the pentagram, the pentagram's relationship to the golden section, etc. It's really quite beautiful. And these kinds of analyses, which actually culminated at the end of the 19th century in the theories of Wolfman and the German interpretive school, had incredible power to control and comprehend paintings from uh, pre um, perspective work to contemporary work, well, even the late. The work that was at the time of the late 19th century. The new compositional analyses of Monet and Manet and they got that were completely consistent with the, these geometries. By the time you get to the 20th century, you get a painting like this, they don't work anymore. It's not that the underpainting, the underpainting and the overpainting, and even certain aspects of the relationship between the two, but any geometric analysis or any formal analysis of this painting will miss the point. And so another kind of analysis has to come in for this to stop being an isolated work of visionary genius and start to set in all kinds of other possibilities. Now, Picabia had already painted cartoon-like figures over realistic paintings in the 1930s. 
but the paint technology didn't even exist to create this degree of transparency and the sense of space in the layering. Even in the 1970, uh, or as late as 1970, painters that wanted to paint to take something from a picture and put it on a canvas were having to still squirt lighter fluid on it, use lighter fluid transfer. So this this painting is made possible by new technologies, and new technologies are always, in, I think, implicated in evolutionary and re revolutionary transitions, and almost always will end up being requiring a new analysis. Uh, at the same time as Wolfland and, and, and uh, music, the, the tonal, harmonic, and formal analysis of music began in the early 1800s with a comprehensive analysis of the work of J.S. Bach. J.S. Bach didn't write theories, didn't write things. He wrote the little guidelines, don't use parallel lines. But by analyzing his work, so it's, this is the important thing, he didn't have an analysis and a theory that he put into his work. He had a talent and an intuition he put into his work. We later on analyze it. But it was adequate to comprehend uh, music all the way up to the middle of the 18th, 19th century, in which a guy almost exactly the same time as Wolf and then Schenker produces comprehensive revision of tradition and uh, analysis that transform the entire musical scene called Schenkerian analysis. It's kind of what it looks like. So it works easily for Beethoven. But what was incredible is it immediately set into motion atonal music because he released the formal uh, relationships of the music and the emotional production of the music from its tonal centers. So it allowed tonal tone technique, it allowed um, bar type analysis. You know, so a whole set of 20th century music came alive and became possible because she carried analysis. But it started to feel like a trap in the, in the late 1970s early 1980s, and particularly among percussions, because in the 20th century, percussionists became more and more and more important in orchestral music. And so it went from a couple of drums or a set of drums and triangle to percussion sessions now can be as many as 80 people can be more people in a percussion session in contemporary work than there are violins and everything else. And so that was completely unable to be comprehended in the Schenkerian analysis. And so new analytics, this is an analysis of Stephen Wright's uh, 18 musicians, which is a highly percussive. They, they haven't, it's not there yet, but they're working on new analytic formats, primarily computer-based, just to figure out how do you tell the story of changes in timbre or, or things that don't repeat. <coughs> uh, I've got this for you. Uh, this is an analysis of Girl Talks, What's It All About? Um, this is every old song reference in it and how long they last and how they overlap. And uh, it's pretty amazing if you listen to this piece of, I mean, I know these, you don't even have talk is anymore. It's so, it's so early 2000. <laughs> but I like it. I didn't even know it was a key until he called me up and said, really, I like your lecture about it. <laughs> so you got it all wrong. <laughs> so there's color coded. Uh, I think it's terrific to do it bothers me because I don't think the way you listen to mashups is by sitting around trying to figure out all the references. Like you're missing the point if you don't find a new coherence. You know? So just being able to parse it. It's like every time you call Robert Rauschenberg and you want to do an analysis of a painting, a uh, film or something like that, he said, fine, but please don't break it down into all historical references. That's not what the painting is. Chess players, any chess players in it? I think chess is incredibly interesting. Um, it has a great analytic history, but it has also its periods. It has a, something called a romantic period, where all the analysis is about tricks you could pull on your opponent to steal them. You know, very heroic, you would steal them, trick them into losing their pieces. Then there was modern chess. Modern chess was such an effective pedagogy and analysis that the greatest chess players at the time, one guy named Capablanca, did not lose a game or draw a game. He did not lose a game for 10 traders. He drew and won every game. And basically, he considered, he, he was considered to have ended chess. Uh, the way you do this is very good. You read this book. And it just teaches you eight or nine kind, kinds of pawn structures. You see the blue structure here? So even if you don't know this is a slob defense, you can tell what, that that's a weak form pawn formation. There's an aggressive posture. You see the holes in it? Whereas the front pawn formation on the right are covering four squares here, plus threatening the movement of these two pawns. So 
anybody that sees this game will immediately know this read this book how to analyze the game and how to make the move. And what's even more interesting is at 40 moves after this game, where most of the pieces are gone and there's only a few pawns left, it will, it will still be in this pattern, which is why grandmasters can play hundred simultaneous games without any problem whatsoever. Because basically no matter if as long as everybody there, somebody that he's playing against is not a grandmaster, it will look to the grandmaster every time you walk up to the board, it'll go, da, 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 and he'll say, okay. And then he'll know what to do a hundred times over. So he just walks around the room a hundred times in a row and he wins. And so but what doesn't what this doesn't teach you is what happened in the mid-20th century when six Jewish guys, of course, from, uh, let me emphasize the, let me check this on you. The guys, uh, it was six guys, Jewish guys under oppression in the Middle East, right during the time of the emergence of the Nazis. Um, Capablanca, a Cuban, who had, like, it was really, chess was about to be retired as a game. And they invented a new game called hypermodern chess. And in this, instead of attacking at the center, which everyone assumed was good, that was the external value take control of the center, they decided just to put the pieces in the opening in their best place without engaging the opponent at all. And, and many psychological historians have analyzed this group as they had, they were Jewish people in an, in an anti-Semitic context. They had to basically learn how to stay invisible and position themselves as best as possible. So they learned this technique of avoiding any confrontation on the board, whether they were black and white, placing their pieces in the most potent places that they could get them for a later attack, and then attacking. Now, not one of them ever won a world champion, but no one, cha no world champion after that ever won another world championship without using their feelings. And so, and now, the hypermodern, all the hypermodern pawn formations is a chapter in that book. Uh, on the formal analysis, uh, I was hoping Doug would be here, so, I'm going to act like I actually know something about formal analysis. Uh, this is uh, a formal, you know, formal analysis has a long history in architecture. It, it occurs before, it probably starts, it takes formalized in blue way and the enlightenment, but even before that, there's indication, you know, there's proportional relationships and ABA forms and all that sort of stuff. But Bill Wolfson, uh, it doesn't really get codified and associated particularly with a cultural project. Uh, Wolflin sets it in motion. He has two periods, one in which he associates it with a kind of psychological question. Architecture he thought of was empathetic, was the result of empathetic projections of new understandings of our body as the side of the scene of our mind. And so the Renaissance was all about part of the whole relationship because our mind had this incredible power, uh, power to discriminate, articulate. The Baroque was about the fact of connectivities. So it broke down part of the whole relationship and moved holistic connectivities. In, 19, in 1898, he wrote an incredible article um, as a sort of follow-up on a book called, he wrote called Renaissance Baroque, which anticipated Freud's insight from two years later about the difference between hysterical paralysis of the hand and real paralysis of the hand. What, what Freud discovered was that people that had real paralysis of their hand lost the use of these muscles atrophy because these are, to an anatomist, hand muscles. And so they, they're not used and they actually have to feed. But the people with hysterical paralysis of the hand, the only thing that was, and you would know that because they, you could get them to actually use their hand for short periods of time under hypnosis. This is when he was studying hypnosis. He discovered that uh, even though their hand was paralyzed, these two muscles would never have to feed. And so it was not the hand that was paralyzed, but the idea of the hand. And it was a really uh, a beautiful insight. And actually, the great poet, poet Austin called it the greatest insight about humanity by a human nature. Peter, uh, Peter Eisenman, in his book, The Formal Foundations of Modern Architectures, set into motion probably the most powerful but also egregious uh, kind of formal analysis in the sense that of its, it, it, he distilled it from cultural context, from uh, <coughs> any deep idea of meaning, and particularly from any intentions of the architect. The most famous analysis of this building, Casa del Fascio, by uh, uh, <laughs> he wanted to say, "Remind me of that in a minute." What is his name? Who's the Italian? 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 Who's the
there one day, I wait a couple of days and then it's there. So, I don't know who all these people are putting that stuff on, but thank you. <laughs> and uh, I, I, one of my exit reviews said, thank the internet for making this exit review pop. I'm sorry I gave that away, Jeff. It's a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but anyway, that hinge is crucial. It didn't exist. I, you know, it's called a scissor hinge and occasionally called an accordion hinge. I've been trying to find the history of it. But without it, that wouldn't be there. And that's the thing. And in fact, the analysis of how this building was built that makes all the sliding and responsibility is not part of Peter's thinking. It would be crucial to the right thing in that. And so as you change your analyses, these are the kind of things you I expect you to be able to do. Not only get me to understand your work, but teach me to look at older work in new ways so it brings me comes back to life again. The goal of all contemporary work is to turn all pre-contemporary work back into contemporary work. And so Bernard Schumann, who all know the formal analyses of uh, Rotunda. I'm kind of a little bit rotunda. Villa Rotunda. You all know the analysis of it because it's pretty easy. It's a square. So you don't really have to draw it. Um, and so everybody you know, they, they understand it. And then Bernard Schumann writes this wonderful paragraph because uh, he's interested in events and occurrences. He writes a wonderful paragraph about Villa Rotunda having nothing to do with its formal analysis about being a horror movie that you walk in the front door and you're ready to leave. You go and you're back at the front door and then you go to the side and back. Way, it has a greater sense of freedom because 
architectural conceits is always, in a sense, present and therefore in a sense of present. And now I'm finding people that are building on his analysis. I guess one last thing. So that was the first thing. Analyze. That's the most important thing. Learn how to, a new way to analyze out in your worship. The last thing, <coughs> do this to yourself, is kind of think about why. There's not one word in any of this conference text about why we should be doing these things. It's too early. You know, uh, why should we? So we now know why punk happened in Manchester and all this. I mean, we have reasons about why that music was successful and why it spread. But at the time, you don't have to know why. It's just when you know you're bored, you're tired, you, want, you don't got a job, and you want to go drink, and that's it. You can get free drinks if you don't know court. So I think architecture has a political role but not, you know, not about setting people free, but make, not giving people more existential niches, niches, about making people feel that they are centered themselves and what they do is valuable in the world. And I just, so, uh, just to connect this to, well, I think you'll know which workshop this is. I just want you to show the progress of sculpture, just a quick progress of sculpture in the 20th century, Constance Kikusi. A little bit fatter, a little bit more voluptuous, a little more pornographic is uh, Jeff Kikusi. And then that's so this makes me feel good about myself. And so I would probably <laughs> put that now. <laughs> and then it also connects to excessive on. I, I think this is the only example. Christy, this is the only example. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>